Now, a lot of the time, I've seen a lot of people commenting in my videos about how they don't have a graphics card and they really need one but don't have the money. So I set myself a challenge to try and find something cheap that could play those latest esports titles and some of those older AAA games. So I hopped to eBay and bought this oddly fitting £4.70 HD 4770. The Radeon HD 4770 we have here is the Sapphire variant, but for some reason is missing the fan. I'm not even quite sure how you lose that, but I'm willing to let that slide as fans are incredibly cheap. Introduced into the market in mid-2009, it cost around £80 or $105. US It has a core clock of 750MHz and 512MB of GDDR5 VRAM clocked in at 800MHz. It's based on the Terascale architecture and uses the RV740 graphics processor, offering comparable performance to that of a HD4830 at a much lower cost and a mere 80 watts of power draw, it was a big hit with mid-range gamers upon its initial release, and thanks to its supporting DirectX 10.1, it's continued to stay fairly prominent up until its final driver release in late 2013, however that doesn't mean it can't handle its own today. But before we can see how it performs we need to get some form of cooling onto it. So let's get some thermal paste onto the card as I doubt it has ever been changed considering the state the card was actually in. But sapphire cards are usually some of the best cards available, so I'm hoping this card is no exception when it comes to taking it apart and getting it working again. Now an interesting thing about this card is the reason that it was a big hit with gamers. It was the first graphics card based on the 40 nanometer lithography which when converted to real world performance meant that power consumption was much lower than alternative cards like the HD4850 or the alternatives offered by Nvidia. So low in fact that many people would just plug this card into their pre-built and use a Molex to 6 pin converter just to give the card the remaining 5 watts it needed. Very similar to what people are doing today with those high powered RX 460 cards that need you to have a 6 pin connector. And turning our attention to the heatsink we can see that we need to get a fan on it. So I grabbed an OEM 120mm fan, which as you can see looks like it's been left and not moved for a long time. So clearly the easiest way to clean it is to get it to the sink and flick on the water. With it done, and the wind today perfect for drying, I put it up on the roof to dry as usual, and waited for 10 minutes. Which you guys don't have to do, because we can just put in a transition here. From here on we have a heatsink, a fan and some tape, which should pretty much sum up exactly what my idea is. You could use cable ties, but unfortunately I still need to get some more of those. And the electrical tape does blend in quite nicely. The card does still luckily have the pins for providing the fan with power. So luckily we don't need to get any extension cables or mod the card in any intricate ways, and I wouldn't really trust myself doing that anyway, so we just plugged it straight into the previous existing fan header. And although it may not look great, it still looks a bit better than I thought it would. But hey, as soon as I booted it up, it was so cool that I managed to get a nice overclock on it, to 830MHz on core and 850MHz on memory, with the card's temperatures topping out at 62 degrees C after running Unigine Valley for a solid hour. So anything within these temps is now probably considered safe. But how does this translate into real world gaming performance? Let's find out. Up first we have the most prominent esports title with CSGO which ran at a 95fps average with the low settings in the 720p resolution. You could put this all the way up to 1080p with probably high settings and it would still be playable, but for the sake of achieving the highest FPS we scored a 95fps average and a minimum of 50fps, which is definitely not bad for a sub £5 graphics card. A lot of people have been asking me to start benchmarking this game, so here we have Rust running with mainly medium settings and a few of the more intensive options set to low. We achieved a nice 33 FPS on average, which is a blind sight better than a lot of people are getting with integrated graphics. Even in combat we hardly saw any issues at all, with the frame rate hardly dipping below 30. A sort of competitive game I suppose, well at least it's been getting big on Twitch recently. We have Halo Online running with medium settings in the 900p resolution, for a nice 40fps average, which is great considering the price of the card and the settings it runs at on the Xbox 360. As for the latest Bethesda RPG playable on the card, we have Skyrim running with a flawless 47fps average and minimums of 26fps, 
all while being played with high settings in the 1080p Full HD resolution, a huge step up in visuals and performance over comparable consoles of this price range. Towns and cities proved to be no issues even when in heavy combat. A test of an unoptimized game, now we have GTA 4 which ran as a pleasant enough 33fps average with the medium settings in the 720p resolution. It was definitely playable, but the game, even with recent patches, is still fairly tough on capable cards like our HD4770. Still, the dips down to 26fps were infrequent and for the most part it was incredibly smooth running. And finally, as for Grand Theft Auto V, it lacks the 15.2 patch with our drivers that many of our long-term viewers will know is a huge issue when we test out older AMD cards like the HD4890. And as the card has no way to process the massive world going on around it, it led to frequent drops in FPS and leading down to an eventual low of 6 FPS minimum, which brought our average down to around 20 FPS. If you could somehow get modded drivers to work, which I've looked into but just haven't put into practice, you'd have a better chance of getting the game to work nicely. So am I going to recommend you go out and buy this card? Well I have seen it going considerably cheaper than the comparable HD5770 cards and onwards, as well as Nvidia's offerings. And when playing those older titles and those newer indie games, the card really shines, and it's virtually no different in performance to the ones just above it. However, lacking DirectX 11, it really limits it in a lot of ways, and some games like GTA 5 are hindered by the complete lack of driver support. So really, if you want a card that can play your eSports titles on a budget, and you need a card that has low power consumption, this is definitely one of the cards I'd consider. Thank you very much for watching, good night! So I've got a big video coming up, so apologies if there are any delays. Don't forget you can always like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and you can always check us out on Patreon if you want to help support the channel.